I don't know if it sounds weird, but I did really feel like a foreigner in my own country because it's the motherland, right? And and we always, I've always kind of dreamed about it.、Um, it's the food that I cook, and I realized I know nothing about <laughs> Korean food. You're listening to the Taste Podcast. I'm editor in chief Matt Rodbard here with senior editor Anna Hazel. On today's show, we have Dukey Hong, the chef and owner of the Sunday Hospitality Group, and co-author of the cookbook Korea Town. Also on the show later on, we'll have Food and Wine's restaurant editor Jordana Rothman. But Matt, how was it catching up with Dukey, your co-author and co-conspirator? <laughs> We were co-conspirators. We wrote the book Korea Town together about. Three years ago, and、um, we we really haven't been talking that much because he lives in San Francisco now.、Um, so we really he like showed up at the office, and we caught up. It was really fun. Yeah, your book came out three years ago now, so a lot has changed since then. All of the Korea towns across the country, across the United States, have changed a lot. I would imagine. Absolutely, it's amazing to see the growth.、Um, it's amazing to see the chef community embrace Korean food. I mean, like we we talk about Atlanta, we talk about New York, we talk about Portland and L.A. All these cool restaurants are. Opening.、Um, we also talk about how, when we were doing the book and and proposing it, like. Five years ago, to publishers, how it really wasn't embraced with open arms as much as we thought. And now there are a million cookbooks about Korean food. There are a few out there.、Um, I like many of them.、Um, I think more Korean cookbooks is a good thing. Well, hopefully, you guys have another one in you. I don't know. I think we do. I I, I think we'll, we'll see what happens. Here's Matt talking to Dukey. Yuki Hong, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Matt Rothbard, thank you so much. I, I can't believe I'm on your platform. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen you. We we text and and call a lot and chat on the phone, but I haven't seen you in person in a couple of years. And、yeah. you just come into you came right into the studio, and we're like. Going right into the podcast. Yeah, there, no rest, no high. We actually didn't even catch up outside of this. This is like、no. we're catching up. So if it sounds blabbery, it <laughs> probably is, is. Yeah, catching up.、Mm-hmm. Um, so two and a half years ago, we released our book, Korea Town,、yeah. and I mean it changed my life.、Mm-hmm. I assume it changed. Your, you could say it changed your life.、Um, it was one of my proudest moments ever as a journalist,、mm-hmm. and major credit to you for just helping me. You know, collaborating and tell that、mm-hmm. story of Koreatown. I think a lot has happened since we released a book. But first, just just reflecting on、yeah. that period when we were making the book, when we were like making the book. What do you most remember about us making that book? I mean, making the book was longer than two and a half years, right? Oh, four released, years ago. Yeah, it, yeah. it was because it took about a couple of years to make the book. And making the book, the most memorable moments, to be honest, isn't.、Um, All the "quote unquote" cool stuff we did, but it's actually like the most memorable. I don't know why it keeps thinking、uh, Sam, who was our photographer, Sam Ryan, and we were just at a Motel Six. It was some janky motel hotel type place, and we were like shooting in the parking lot. We had like vegetables laid out, and I just remember like, oh, like this is we're really working to create this cookbook. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like a bougie. We didn't like. Flying first class anywhere. It wasn't easy to create it. it、uh, the nature of our book being very travel oriented, different cities all across the country. It was not something that we just shot in the studio, and that was that was something、yeah. that we were very proud of. And I just remember it being really hard, but really fulfilling.、Um, and I wouldn't have done it with any other people than you and it, Sam. It, I'll take us back to that moment. So that was in Duluth, Georgia.、Yeah. We were staying north of Atlanta, like thirty. Thirty miles. We were in a we were in a Motel Six. Yeah, literally, it was a Motel Six. And、yeah. we had gone to the Beaufort Highways Farmers Market,、mm-hmm. and we'd met with the owner, who's Korean American, really interesting guy, and he plied us with all this amazing produce. Yeah. And we were like, he just gave it to us, and we we're like, okay, we need to do something with this because it's going to go bad. We didn't have a kitchen. Yeah. So yeah. then we got all the produce together. We put it down on a piece of paper, paper that、yeah. we bought at a craft <laughs> store, and literally shot it from the. Overhead in、yeah. a parking lot. Yep. From the top of our rental car, Sam was up there. I remember. Yeah, I was like, "What is going on?" <laughs> That's and, how we made our book. We、yeah. didn't have a studio. No, and Sam's like a legit photographer. Like, yeah, he's like w- widely known around the world. <laughs> and we're like, he's on top of a rental car. Yeah, trying to makeshift it, but it was just so incredible that. That was kind of the attitude of Korea Town, you know. Let's talk about developing our recipes because you know we were at your apartment on Thirty Fifth Street.、Uh, heat was maybe not working. I don't yeah, think it, it was, ever worked.、Uh, it was a it was like an electric stove, like pretty much. 
their recipe shouldn't have been developed in that kitchen in, in the New York City standard New York City apartment. But I remember saying, hey, if it works in our apartment, it works anywhere. So we know that it works in homes. And if you have fancy equipment, no fancy equipment. And we, I remember you, and we had so much contention over it because I was like, Matt, like everyone has a blender. Everyone has a, they're like, no, they don't. You know, not everyone has this. And I think it was a good collaboration of like, I'm used to like having set kitchen equipment. And you coming from somebody that's not in the kitchen, you're like, nope, they, that's not, that's an assumption you can't make, you know? And, um, I learned a lot in that process and kind of relearned how to cook, uh, essentially. Yeah. I think uh, when we were developing those recipes, we, we, we were really paring it down. That was a big mm-hmm. part of our sal- sales mm-hmm. pitch when we went out and, and did all the press. But it really was out of necessity because you literally some days did not have knives there. Like, no, I'm yeah. going to call you out. Like, <laughs> I'm going to call you out, Dookie. It was like, in my work kitchen. You didn't have knives at your house. Nobody cooks at home. No <laughs> chef cooks at home. If they are, more credit to them. <laughs> They're better than I am. Do you remember like walking up the to your to the roof, like yeah. four story walk up with like all these bags from yeah. H Mart? Absolutely. We shot stuff in the rooftop. I think a couple of the photos in the cookbook you shot from your iPhone or something like, like it's, it's, yeah, it's, like seven of them or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember, yeah, going to H Mart. Like we literally walked from H Mart because it was like maybe a fifteen minute walk. Buying groceries, like we did it as if somebody reading our book would do it, and that's how we know, or we're so confident that the recipes work. Uh, funny thing is, even two and a half years later, which is crazy because you said that, and now I'm like, oh yeah, it's been two and a half years. I still get Instagram tags. I'm sure you do too. Of like, hey, I made this from the book. I was like, what? Still? Like that's crazy, you know? It was amazing. I think this past weekend I saw uh, someone making our, our kimchi bokumbap, mm-hmm. and they mm-hmm. were like. It was a random person, and yeah, we still get a lot of tags. Yeah. The book's actually selling still, mm-hmm. and I'm just really proud of it. I think yeah. I'd love to do another book. We can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> off, let, off podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's talk about Korean food in general. I yeah. think when the book dropped in February 2016, Korean food was still, um, you know, it was it was happening, but it wasn't certainly in the media that as much. No. You were then you were at Baekjung opening this restaurant, becoming a, a real figure in the in the mm-hmm. movement. But then, like a million things happen. Like, Absolutely. There's so many players, and we can go over those. But just tell me, where do you think Korean food has gone since we released a book in 2016, early 2016? I mean, I think we're in the we're getting there, right? Exactly. <clears throat> I remember starting Koreatown and. I remember our Matt asked me, like, what do you want out of this? Like, even before we started and kind of read the proposal. And I was like, this is so cool. You know, me being Korean, just a natural connection. But I remember saying, like, our goal, it'd be super cool if one day some family in, I don't know, Kansas, you know, asking their family, I want American, Japanese, uh, Chinese, which is a part of the natural conversation. I would love Korean food to be a part of that option. Uh, And I really feel like it's getting there, you know, and we've in the making of the book, learned so much. I was like, oh, I didn't even know. Madison, Wisconsin still is a very memorable city to me. I was like, what is Chef Tori doing there? Like, Tori Miller. Yeah, Tori Miller, uh, incredible chef. And he's doing Korean food in the middle of a place where I was like, what? what? What's going on? You know, and I think it's getting more normal, you know, and Korean food is not some exotic uh, foreign cuisine or language anymore. It's people kind of have a taste of it now and like you said there's a whole revolution of korean chefs or korean cooks doing cool things now i just want to shout out a few of my favorites um we've got the the crew at auto boy in new york lenjp we've got her name is han also in new york Mm -hmm. uh kwang o at baru we've got cody and jayun at heirloom barbecue market and of course we've got david chang opening major domo in los angeles which i think is going to be probably a, a restaurant of the year candidate yeah I haven't made it there yet, but what he's doing is clearly Korean. It's it's his most Korean restaurant. What are some of your, on top of those, favorite or just memorable Korean meals or chefs around the country? Yeah. Um, I got to shout out some West Coast people, I feel like. Definitely. Now. And it's so crazy, though. All the people that you've mentioned, I'm, I'm so blessed. And I feel like we're so blessed that we can call them friends, you know. And through the process of the book and just being on this platform, um, and the common connection is that we we enjoy Korean food and enjoy cooking it. And uh, I would say a lot of the West Coast chefs, even in San Francisco, I, I mean, my idol is, is Chef Corey Lee and kind of what he's done in the fine dining world, injecting kind of Korean food in a place where it's not so uh, normal to be in, I guess. But he's made it so beautiful. Um, Portland, uh, Han, uh, uh, Han, he's such a 
he's a character. He's What's a, his restaurant? Uh, Kim Jong Grillin oh, of, yeah, right. of Chef Han Huang. Uh, just absolute badass. He's a character. Uh, Soul Sausage, Ten and Young, like they're pioneers in the LA game. Talking about LA, um, so many, and I just feel like we're like wow. Like I'm not I'm not saying we started it, but at least we've at least connected here and there. Uh, yeah, you know? I, we didn't start it. You didn't start it. Of course, a lot of these folks had been cooking, but I think what Koreatown did is we really we documented it in a in a really important moment when it was really rising and we traveled the country and we weren't just talking to celebrity chefs, but no. we we're talking to like ojimas around the country and talking about like how they cook Korean food in America. Oh yeah. And now like two and a half years after release of our book, it's clearly people know Tendon Chige. Like yeah. people make it at home. Yeah. We get it pinged on our Instagram all the time. I feel like if there was it's like Chinese food. I mean I'm I'm in San Francisco now and that's kinda where like Chinese food started in Chinatown. If someone documented that process before it the general sauce chicken and all that blew up and now it's just the main staple um in American cuisine, I feel like we had an opportunity to do that or document that at that very unique time that you said of Korean food. And hopefully in 10, 20, 30 years, as Chinese food is now, it's just the main staple. Korean food is a main staple of American cuisine too. So I wanted to talk to you about going to Korea. You were able to yeah. go. You you uh, were on television quite a bit with the Today Show. You uh, the Olympics in Korea that is in uh, in February. So how, what was that like? You had not been back to Korea since you were born there. Born, so, yeah. yeah. What's uh, that like, man? Going back, to, <laughs> going back. I don't know if it sounds weird, but I did really feel like a foreigner in my own country because it's the motherland, right? And and we always, I've always kind of dreamed about it. Um, it's the food that I cook. Um, and I realized I know nothing about <laughs> Korean food. Uh, Matt has actually been to Korea more than I have, and I always make fun of him that he's more Korean than uh, I am. Um, and it's been an incredible experience. I got to go uh, with my dad. I remember talking to Matt, like, oh, me and my dad made this promise. Like, once we go, we're going to try to go together. But Matt's right. Um, 27 years I haven't been. I, got, I came here for free on my mom's lap. So going back to Korea was... Quite an experience, and obviously the food is just second to none, and you feel like you know. <clears throat> and as a chef, trying to do Korean food in America, it was actually kind of embarrassing, to be honest. Some of the th- some of the assumptions you had made, absolutely right. Some of the things you thought you knew, it broke everything um, in a good way. And and I feel like every chef or every kind of person in any career um, that has some sort of drive should always start challenging kind of uh, anything that they feel like is firm ground and. So uh, the Korea experience, which I went <clears throat> coincidentally uh, with in the Olympic period, which was also just an incredible environment in the in the whole country, um, it was a big learning experience. It was ten days of just eating as much as I could, um, and pretty much realizing I know nothing about Korean food. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what were some? I, I saw your gram. <clears throat> you were you were doing bosom. You were doing gumtatang. Yeah. You were all about the barbecue. I feel like you yeah. hit some barbecue spots. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, you worked at a barbecue restaurant, but still in Korea, was it better? The barbecue. It um, it was. I think Koreans here, and we talked about this in the book of gas versus charcoal. Yeah. Gas is normal here just because the high rises and like the whole laws. Korea doesn't really have that. Um, charcoal is more normal. So to not have charcoal is, like, very rare. So honestly, any meat tastes really good because it's kind of like cheating. Uh, It's like the MSG fire of, like, Korean meats or meats in general. And I feel like just having that meal was uh, was incredible. You're right. I've done barbecue for uh, almost three years, two two plus years, and going to Korea and just eating barbecue. It wasn't just barbecue, but I, I love meat myself. So just kind of seeing what it's about. Uh, eventually, obviously, my goal in San Francisco is to open up a Korean barbecue restaurant. So uh, it did help. But um, once again, the fermentation. Um, I think we talk about it in the book a lot. It's it's the foundation of Korean cuisine. And seeing how it really works uh, in any format. Um, Obviously, the changs, the kanjang, the gochujang, which is all the basis for sauces and stews, but even like lightly pickled stuff. Um, I didn't know Korean food had a delicacy to it, you know, that it, it's not always about this pungent, f- fermented, like kimchi, like spice, um, or this deep layered fermentation. It was also, oh, this beautifully uh, 
lightly pickled or lightly fermented n a m u l and and mm-hmm. greens and like a perilla leaf. Yeah, and, and, and like nothing that. crazy. You're like, oh, I could have, I could have, I could have done that, you know. And it works. It works beautifully. And um, I think I appreciated that. And and I think that's where I kind of saw the finesse of Korean food. Uh, what was a dish that you had in Korea that you'd absolutely never had anywhere? You, you'd never experienced it in America, and you were like, "Wow, this is this is amazing." Um, Jeju black pig. I think the what we talked about. I remember when I operated the Korean barbecue. Jeju restaurant. Island. Once yeah, that is. Yeah, Jeju Island is. I would say most accurately the Hawaii of Korea. Right. So it's it's a remote island known for. Their oranges or their tangerines, um, but also their black pigs, which they raise. It's their uh, Berkshire, it's their Kura Buddha, whatever you want to call it. Um, super meaty, almost like you're eating beef. Uh, and the flavor alone, just a little bit of sea salt, is enough. And I remember everyone hyped it up, right? And usually when you hype up food, you're like, eh, whatever. It's a letdown, right? Yeah. And honestly, Jeju black pig is like, Damn, y'all didn't hype it up enough because I want to bring it back to uh, America. But obviously, you, can, you can't. Did you go to lost. Jeju or did they, were they importing it? To They're importing. So <clears throat> even in yeah, even in Seoul, they get it from Jeju it. to get it. Um, but yeah, I would have loved to gone. I, we had a really tight schedule, but I think Jeju Black Pig was some one of those things, and I ate it in this house. Like literally, time like Time and Sports Illustrated follow, followed us. We probably had to walk like 30 minutes into... We got dropped off and had to walk like 15, 20 minutes into this house. One lady operates it. One grandma operates it. And it's on a stone <clears throat> slab. It was just... And then the kimchi on the bottom, all the pork fat dripping down, kind of what we've always had. Different level, man. Was it like Different a bosan level. then? It was... No, it, yeah. was, it was barbecued, barbecued uh, pork okay. belly. So no seasoning, no marinade or anything. Just really good quality pork. And all the accoutrements, the kimchi, the, all the pickled, uh, the lettuce, um, the daikon. And you're like, wait, this is, I've had this before, but I'll also never had this before. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about San Francisco. So you yeah. left New York. Uh, I, was, I was super bummed. But yeah. you were like, I'm just going for a few weeks. going <laughs> to open up this, this, this fried chicken thing and be back. Yeah. And I, I haven't seen you in, uh, what? I mean, I saw you in San Francisco, but I haven't seen you in New York in like yeah. a couple years. Mm-hmm. You're living there full time. So what drew you to the Bay Area? And, and what made you stay? Because you're kind of there now, it seems um, like. Which is very weird. Uh Matt, you're a New Yorker. I consider myself a New Yorker. Um, I still love New York. Um, I've recently, San Francisco, I've kind of come around like, oh, it's like my second love. It's my second city. It's it's another second home for me. And it wasn't honestly, oh, oh, I want to go to Bay Area. It was, I want to leave New York. Um, It could have been any other awesome cities in, in the United States. I had a chance kind of dinner. And I think all my kind of opportunities and relationships are always like, never planned i'm like not that smart to be like oh like mastermind this and and plan that um i met andrew chow of uh the boba guys and we just had a meeting a mutual friend was like hey you guys should connect you guys are like you know cool like you guys will get along he asked hey like what do you want to do next like you did the korean barbecue thing i said dude honestly half jokingly half really serious like i just want to fry chicken out of a window and just like just not worry about life you know and He was like, you actually could do that if you wanted to. Um, he had a kitchen, and he bought a space. He runs a bubble tea shop, so no need for a kitchen. He had it. He's like, if you want to do it, cool. If not, cool. Uh, three months after that dinner, I was in San Francisco. Uh, no contract, no uh, just a handshake deal. And I think even he was surprised that I was there. So, oh, shoot, you actually came. Uh, okay, yeah, go to the kitchen and cook. Um, and that's kind of where it started. And Matt, you're right. It, it wasn't... Um, And as like, I don't want to say as bad as it sounds, my heart is always in New York. So it was supposed to be a temporary thing. You know, I was like, oh, maybe if I leave New York for a few months, a year or two, um, that bug will die down and then I'll go back to New York and I'll be myself again. Um, But I fell in love with San Francisco. You know, I really fell in love with California and everybody there and how they embraced me even with all my faults and i messed up a lot like it's so well, it was crazy. tough I, I saw you uh i talked to you a few months after you opened up the the little spot on fillmore yeah. and i felt like you were in the weeds and yeah. it was tough getting the chicken right and yeah. you know yelpers were, were serious <sighs> assholes I love, man I love um <laughs> they were assholes honestly to, you. to be honest i i actually don't i'm not one of those chefs yes yeah but i don't read a lot of yelp yeah but andrew would 
very nicely screenshot them <laughs> to me, all the negative comments. But I honestly need that, to be honest, because I need to push it. I'm never, I mean, I've never struggled with like, I never thought my product was the best. Um, but when Yelpers tell you, or, or, and yes, there's some crazy Yelpers that you got to ignore, but there's certain, at the end of the day, they're your customers. And it was bad, to be honest. The first few months, uh, I was trying to be something that I, that I wasn't. I was trying to cater to, oh, I think they want this. Henceforth, I will cook that. You know, it wasn't more like, hey, I believe in this and this is really delicious and I know people will like it. So, yeah, the first month and a half was an incredible challenge. I think I saw you kind of in that yeah. period. I was just defeated, you know, yeah. and um, there was a lot of like shame element, embarrassing element. But um, it was over a weekend um, where I just changed the concept, you know, and the beautiful thing about not being in a structure or corporate setting um, and uh, technically being your own boss is you have flexibility and mobility. So if I didn't want to sell fried chicken that coming Monday or Tuesday, I didn't have to, right? Because I report to me, right? Um, and I did. I stopped uh, and turned it into a snack shop. Um, and that just took off. Yeah. And what were some of the dishes that just really took off? Because you got a lot of great attention. And the yeah. food was, I, I tried the food. It was really delicious. So appreciate honestly. it. Yeah. But what, 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 were you, what are you serving there at that spot? At that spot, at this spot, at Sunday Bird right now, it's a really uh, fun snack menu, all small items. I would say everything is within very personalized, uh, very personal sized. Uh, the hottest selling one is our uh, popcorn chicken with uh, fried rice cakes, which popcorn chicken, I didn't know, is a very classic combination of bubble tea and uh, it's a bubble tea shop. Every every bubble tea shop, yeah, has common, a popcorn yeah. chicken. Yeah, I did not. Andrew one day was like, "Oh, you got to do like popcorn chicken." And I was like, "Bro, I have a degree from the Culinary Institute of America. I'm not making popcorn chicken." And he was like, "Shut up and do it." You know. Um, and mind you, obviously, he's the the awesome guy that he is and the business savvy that he is. That's the most highest selling one. So I'm like so humbled every time I see it. I was like, I really don't know anything. Uh, kimchi fried rice, flaming corn cheese. Um, wings, we do our thing of wings, and then on the weekends, we do whole chicken. Man, but see, that was the only the start. And you you went from that restaurant, which is Sunday Bird, to the restaurant Sunday at the Museum, which is at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. Now, I was like, you were, you were quietly like making this thing happen, and then I'm like, I'm reading you in the New York Times. A guy in Michan <laughs> drops this amazing article yeah, about you guys. Yeah. And then I read it about it in the San Francisco Chronicle yeah. as well. So what is that all about, Sunday at the Museum? And how's that been going? Sunday at the Museum is a collaboration. And it's just just continue that relationship with the Boba Guys. Um, Andrew and Ben, who's the other co-founder of Boba Guys, and I, we partnered up to do the food and beverage program at the Asian Art Museum. Asian Art Museum itself is going through this huge, uh, it's very publicly known, $90 million, something crazy transformation of the building. They're building a rooftop bar. Like, they're really, and I feel like this whole trend of museums really focusing on their food and beverage program is not something new. Um, Untitled at Whitney, Flora Bar, like, uh, obviously in C2. Amazing restaurant. Yeah, in C2 at the MoMA, uh, SF MoMA. It's not something new, but everyone's just upping their game. I don't know if all the museum people had a meeting. It was like, hey, let's all up our game. But we came in just to in- in- inoculate kind of some fresher kind of take on um, food and beverage. Uh, Asian Art Museum now is the first I heard from somebody, some probably some PR person, was saying it's the first museum in America that sells bubble tea or boba, right? So even just to be a part of something like that... Um, is incredible. Sunday at the museum itself is the restaurant portion of Asian Art Museum, and we serve just fun things: fermented jasmine tea leaf salads. Um, it's not Korean, Korean, but there's Korean elements, kimchi fries, and all that. So we have fun, but overall, it's a very approachable lunch menu. And so you do lunch, and that's uh, kind of Pan Asian, mm-hmm. and then you do a dinner service. We do on Thursday nights. Thursday one nights. night only. Yeah. So dollar Ooh, oysters. That's smart. The one yeah. night only. Well, the museum is only open. At night for one night, so oh, it, I wasn't the genius up. behind that. Yeah, people line up for people, it, right? Yeah, people. It's the response. I've always ran out of oysters every time. Um, oysters. We do some bosam. Uh, I get to stretch it a little bit there, where the clientele after six p.m. is a little different than your eleven a.m., twelve p.m. clientele um, in the civic center. So we have a lot of fun. Chinese sausage, fried rice, uh, fried rice cakes. We have a lot of fun, and a lot of people like our Thursday night menu. 
And we're all, this is all building towards, you mentioned it before, but opening a barbecue restaurant in yeah. San Francisco. Now, we went there for our research for the yeah. book long ago. <laughs> we went out with Stuart Brioza. We yeah. met with uh, Corey as well, mm. Corey Lee. But, you know, I think the, 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 the statement was that, not from us, because we love, we love all Korean food, yeah. but the statement was like, there's not great Korean food in San Francisco. Yeah. We heard that refrained often. Uh, do you agree now that you live there? Are, and what will you be doing with this barbecue restaurant mm-hmm. when you open it? I definitely agree. Uh, I feel it more. I feel like one of those San Francisco people that we talked to a few years ago saying like, oh, why are they complaining? You know, it's like whatnot. And I realized we're really spoiled in New York. The L.A. people are super, super spoiled. Um, I know people that just go – that won't eat and save it and just do a quick trip to L.A. To, uh, <laughs> they go to food. L.A. for yeah, free and, food. <laughs> and honestly, I completely understand it. And there's no – it's not a bad thing or wrong. I just think somebody hasn't done it, right? Cause, and mind you, SF has some incredible restaurants. And there's an article recently how it's like now California is on par with New York, you know? And for me, um, it's – something that I want to change as a Korean American myself. And so this Korean barbecue restaurant is something that I want to do to just provide a need uh, in that neighborhood that I feel like is void of it. Um, It's not an ego play. It's not (laughs) some thing that I'm trying to, you know, transform the whole Korean food in in San Francisco. We just want to be a place where people enjoy could get what I feel like is good Korean food. Good barbecue yeah. with sides. Yeah, good meat. And I feel like the panchan is always the side. Even in yeah. the name, it's a side dish. Uh, I really want to focus on the panchan too. Um, and that being in itself a great meal. So uh, we have a lot of fun things planned for it. Have you been out to Toisei in the Outer Sunset? That, that no, garage. no, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? I, I wrote about for Savor yeah. and Dan and I went. And I thought it was – the food was like okay, but like uh-huh. it was such a cool super place. Super cool. Yeah, super cool. Um, and a lot of people go. It's it's packed, you know. And it's one of those – it's a drinking environment, yeah. you know. and It's a pocha. Yeah. And like you said, the food is the food. Is the food and, and, and it, it's the job. But no one's going there for some culinary thing. They're like, I need a drink. Give me my food to compliment my drink, you know. So it does the job, and it's it's a great place. Yeah. I feel like. Have you ever thought about doing a pocha style restaurant in San Francisco? I just think that city loves to drink, and they, oh, yeah. they it's a it's a party atmosphere when you're yeah. going out there. I mean, or are you sticking with barbecue? No, if the opportunity arises, um, I want to. I, I remember a few months ago, Chef Ed Lee came, a good friend of both of ours, uh, and he was like, "Focus." <laughs> he pretty much he's a, he's a good like uncle mentor of, uh, of mine, and. He was just like, what are you doing? You know, are you going to do Korean barbecue? You're doing this museum thing. You did this fried chicken. Like, I've been hearing about your Korean barbecue thing. Are you going to do it? You know, and he's calling you out. He's he like, did. Do, and, and do the barbecue 100%, thing. 100%. And, and I loved it. And it actually did. It kind of set me straight. I was like, you know what? I'm going to do barbecue. You know, next thing I do, full yeah. focus, going to be barbecue. So what's the, like, unofficial off the record, though, on the record, because this will be here forever, <laughs> timeline for when this will open? I, I learned, I think I learned from you to never say a timeline, because so it will never uh, yeah. it will never pan out, but sooner rather than later. Do you have a lease? Can you say that at least? I do not, know. Okay, so I mean, that's... No. We're that, looking at spaces is probably you. the most, yeah. It's a, t- I mean, that market, even more than New York, is just so hard to find a great... I picked a good city, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, but like, <clears throat> do you want to come back to New York and you want to open here? I mean, I feel like you have so many friends and fans here in New York of your yeah. cooking. Beck Jung, you left, but there you left a lot of, um, you left a, like kind of hanging because you just mm. like bounced out of town. Yeah. Uh, and you, people are like, man, what, where's Dookie? Oh, he's in San Francisco. Oh, man. Right. Are you going to open here in, in New York at some point? I really do. I really want to. And we talked about it. No matter where I go, um, New York will always be home. Um, there's no city that I'd feel this comfortable in, um, even if I'm gone for years or, or months or whatever it is. Absolutely. That's the ultimate goal. And I don't want to say nothing else matters, but uh, I would say nothing else matters than eventually, uh, however long in my career, I would love to have a restaurant in New York City. I think you will. I mean, you've got such a long career ahead of you. Um well, thank you, Dookie, for joining the Taste Podcast. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Maddie. It's been awesome. Here's Matt talking to Food & Wine's restaurant editor, Jordana Rothman. 
Jordana Rothman, welcome to the Taste Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's like so cool to see you. I haven't seen you in a little while, and we're just going to catch up today. I I wanted to talk to you about a lot of things. You have a really cool role at Food & Wine. You're traveling 30 to 40,000 miles a year. Uh, you're going to restaurants around the country, identifying not just the the best new restaurants, but also the classics, and making sure that they're you know doing their job. Tell me, I mean, how how it has it been? You know, you've been at Food and Wine for a few years. Has is this job like very very tiring? I mean, it seems like it's a very very t- tiring job. Oh gosh, I mean, you know, first of all, I should say like this job restaurant editor at Food & Wine, it's like in many ways the job that people like you and I do the work that we do to like maybe one day get, right? Like it's so, it's so, um, it's just a huge honor with obviously like a lot of legacy behind it and people that I have so much respect for have, you know, filled that seat. And so, you know, stepping into it was like a total dream, you know? And and I think one of the things that um, in a lot of creative industries, you forget that like the dream job is a dream. And it's also a job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and That's why I led with tiring. Maybe I was inarticulate, but I didn't want to say it's the best job because yeah. obviously it's a job. But you're, I think you really have a lot of elegance and grace when you when you talk about your role because it is a dream job. And you just said that um, we do build for it. But but really, it's a lot of work. It's right? a lot of work. And I think, you know, it is. First of all, it's a, it's a lot of work, just this sort of logistics of the work in, in terms of, you know, the travel is really significant. And actually, I was just chatting with um, my friend and colleague, uh, Bill Addison, who does a, um, similar work for Eater. We talk about this all the time because, you know, we call ourselves road people and, you know, only road people understand road people. And when you're in that frame of mind, you can kind of only reach across the aisle to other people who understand the strange disorientation of living out of a suitcase for an extended period of time. And um, that experience is amazing, eye-opening, engaging. I found some of the things that I care about the most through the process of just kind of like disengaging, unhooking from, you know, a a normal human being routine. Um, But at the same time, you know, there is uh, there is a toll that it takes both just like physically because like, oh, my God, like you're eating a million meals a day and it's crazy. But also just that emotional experience of really like, you know, losing your exoskeleton Mm -hmm. in a city so that you can, you know, kind of connect to its rhythms and its identity and open yourself up to, um, like, the very specific imprimatur of a city and its chefs and um and you have to lose a piece of yourself to really connect i love to it. how you said that you have to lose a piece of yourself you can't be the new york city editor no. you have to kind of dissolve into the ether i've done this work myself where you go to houston and you have to go to like either you're going to justin use restaurants or you're going to a taqueria and you just gotta open your eyes exactly and i think that you know you talked about to me about the sort of splitting the difference between you know the classics and the new stuff and you you can't just go to a, new, a city and go to the hot restaurant that's been making national waves. You have to understand the underpinning of the city and why that place is important or sometimes why that place has some like detractors locally. You know, like I always think about when Gavin Kazin, you know, a New York City chef, Cafe Baloo, super you know successful here in New York – left New York to go to Minneapolis. And a lot of chefs have been doing that, sort of going home to, to their home cities and opening these really ambitious projects. And of course, you know, his his restaurant there is a runaway success. I think it was also hard for him because there's this, you know, this idea of like the blustery New York person coming into the city and, you know, you know, whether it's accurate or not. And I think in Gavin's case, it's <laughs> it's not the way that he approached it at all. But, you know, coming into a city and and, you know, kind of like knocking away the little guys and, you know, doing it the New York way. And it's like in order to really get why a restaurant matters, you have to get how it plays into the local fabric. You can't just be like, the food is good. You have to look no, at context. It's cultural anthropology, exactly. ethnography. Do you like to use those words when describing your job, or does that feel a little like NYU graduate course <laughs> <laughs> Uh Well, I am an NYU graduate. So, um, okay, there you go. <laughs> but I think that, um, what do I think? I, 
you know, I'm sensitive to overstating the work yeah. sometimes, you know, like I think that, um, you know, food has become obviously this like incredible, um, you know, divining rod that we use to kind of like, you know, find stories and cities and find, you know, the spirit of a place. But um, and, and that work is important to me. I do feel like I'm a food writer, but I, food is just like the lens that I use to kind of see the world around me. But at the same time, it, sh- it should be delicious and fun. And um, I don't want to get overly high minded about it at times because it is dinner after all. And you want people to have a good time at dinner with your recommendation. Yeah. And I want people to like and, you know, if I if I tell the story only about why it matters, then the people that are looking for the story about why it matters will get it. And then the rest of the people who will experience the like meaning of a place by osmosis, just by going and having a good meal, like they'll kind of miss it because like they don't want to read about, you know, all of that stuff necessarily. And so I kind of try to split the difference, you know, like I try to tell the important story, but also ground it in a place that, you know, is rooted in its deliciousness and like how it can be a great time. So you and I, we came up around the same time in the mid-2000s about, I mean, this like 10, 12 years ago in the food writing world. I mean, do you remember those blog wars, like The Eater versus Grub Street versus Time Out, where you were the restaurant editor? Now, how has food writing changed? Oh, my God. I mean, I remember that time so clearly, and it was really like a special time. I mean, that was, you know, the, the battle for like scoops and being first it's just so different now. I mean, I think obviously there are still people playing that game and and that's, you know, that's always like an important pace, but it's certainly not what I'm doing anymore. Um, and it's funny, I, you know, in some ways I think people are still sensitive to, you know, when you're that person who's like pounding the pavement looking for the scoop and like going, you know, going for, for it at all, at all costs people in some ways still relate to me like that, especially in New York. And it's like, I'm not playing. I'm, I don't do that anymore. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I agree. I get hit up. I, like, what's the new restaurant? I'm like, I have my spot, French Louis. I go there all the time. I'm not all about the newest restaurants in New York City. I also like to travel a lot and go to restaurants there. But I, I, I must say that was a really exciting time for me. I thought it was pre-Twitter and it was like a time when reporting was like you actually did go to the venue and you looked, you walked through sawdust to like report on the opening of restaurant. Oh, totally. I mean, they used to do, remember they used to do like the shit show reports and it was like the, you know, the opening party. I mean, just rest, like, restaurants have changed so much. I mean, that's not a thing anymore. It's not. You know, and that's, I I mean, listen, that's good. That's, that's maturity. That's growth. Mm -hmm. Like we're not, you know, it's not about necessarily like, you know, the opening with the bang and like all of that glitz and glamour. Like, I think we allow things to incubate a little bit more now. Um, And maybe, you know, maybe that's just like you and I got old Uh, and we're not doing that anymore. (laughs) But like people still are like, I, you know, (laughs) I think they, I mean, we were recording this the week that the Times and Eater uh, dropped their fall previews. And there's been a lot of hustle in the, in the work. So I'm not saying that people aren't going to those sawdust strewn spaces but i mean you look at eater though the maturity and the growth of eater in particular and it's remarkable where uh, a story about the east village uh chinese uh food resurgence and this beautiful piece that's what eater is known for and not like that that little sharp elbow stories i just love that i love working in that world where those stories are lauded yeah look i mean you know everything has to have a mouth you know it's like it has to have you know, the information's got to get to us somehow. And so there still is room for that just sort of like, hey, here's everything that's happening. And then, you know, even at a place like Eater, you know, there may be that sort of like just, you know, kind of brass tacks news. Like this is all the places that are opening. These are all the new cookbooks. That has a lot of value because it just like it creates the volume. It it sets the sort of gameplay. And then, you know, from there, you know, People go in and they have these experiences and they write these stories and they find, you know, the, um, you know, the, they find the depths and yeah. um, and it all it's part of an ecosystem and all of it is necessary and all of it is important and all of it is fun. Let's talk about food and wine now. Let's do it. Let's talk about your your new your your 10 new restaurants list that, that came out recently. I mean, these names are, are familiar to taste readers. Um Remarkable. Uh, Rima Sale at Reams in Oakland, Jamie Malone at Grand Cafe in Minneapolis, Jennifer Jackson at Voyager in Ferndale, Michigan. Three very, you know, prominent 
and and empowered women in their communities. I mean, were you looking to put one more women in the list? Were you looking or was that just how it shook out? Well, so I should say I do two I research two lists at the same time. So the list that you're reading from right now is actually our twenty eighteen restaurants of the year list. Okay. Um, which can be read as sort of a, a best new list. Um and then the other list is the best new chefs list. And that is not a new restaurants list, although often there are new restaurants reflected on it. It's about that's about the experience of the chef. So one leads with you know, the identity, the person, and the other leads with the place. Um, so, you know, that distinction may be a little bit narrow, um, but I see it, you know, as sort of, you know, the food on the plate versus like the night out. Um, was I looking to put more women on it? Um, you know, it would be disingenuous to say that I don't look for um, a diversity of voice, perspective, um, many different points of diversity, you know, not just the color of your skin, but also, you know, where you're working, what your perspective is, what your background is, what story you're trying to tell, what the cuisine you're working with is, you know, how you're, you know, kind of adding to this chorus, you know, in a meaningful way and kind of like adding your own tone to it. So, um, yes, I do look for that, um, of course. But I think, I don't know, for me, it's really important that I try not to put such a fine point on it only because I feel like when you say, like, look at all the diversity, you're kind of like just part of the problem. I agree. And you you weren't framing it that way. I'm being blunt with it because I'm definitely being blunt intentionally because I think the end user of your publication, the one picking up at the Detroit airport and the the 27 newsstands at the Detroit airport times that by – and people read your magazine at the airport, so let's get real. They're seeing these women from these these restaurants and those three in particular. I love those three chefs in particular – that's fucking good, yeah, man. I love yeah. seeing them represented in your pages because that certainly wasn't the case. I talked to Ruth Royce last week, and she said, you know, she was struggling to find women in the in the in the two, early two thousands at Gourmet, and you know, yeah, I mean, well, she, I, but you, you clearly aren't struggling to find women, right? So, so I guess what I mean by that is that in terms of being part of the problem, like that, what I mean is that. I just want to write about places that I feel really great about and people that I feel really great about and just say, these are the best restaurants, these are the best chefs, and not be like, look at all the women, you know, look at all the diversity. It's just, I feel like the way that you normalize inclusion is just by including, you know? Exactly. And so, well said. And so Absolutely. that is why I really always sort of hesitate around, you know, I, I never, in my own work, never frame it that way because- Ultimately, you and I are sitting around this table and we talk to our peers and these are conversations that happen, you know, in rooms and around dinner tables. But the reader is the person who's picking it up, as you say, in the Detroit airport. And, you know, they don't know all the inside baseball that's happening. And so you just want to you just want them to pick it up and get super inspired. And that is progress and awesome. And so to include someone like Rima Seal, who I find to be probably one of the strongest and most remarkable human beings that I have ever had the pleasure of interviewing. You know, she, when I write a story about the, you know, best new restaurants or the, you know, the best new chefs, most for most of those restaurants, for most of those chefs, being on that list, it's just good for business. It's just good for them. It's all good. It's exciting. It's something to talk about. It, you know, you know, is good for the bottom line, whatever it is, it's good for them. For Reem, it's not only good. It's a lot of things. It's, I think, you know, she feels, you know, honored to be included in these conversations. Obviously, she's doing amazing work. She keeps her head down. She's incredible. But it also reignites the controversy for her. It also has people writing, you know, horrific slurry things on the internet showing up at her doors, you know, protesting. It's not only good for someone like Reem. It's really complicated. And so um, I'm sensitive to that. And and at the same time, it's like, you know, when that list came out, there was, you know, the inclusion of of Reem's, um, you know. You got a lot of letters. We got we wrote a profile of her as well. And and we talked the portrait do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about the controversy around the the, the mural that is at the restaurant? Uh, yeah, you know she uh, there's a mural at the restaurant in Oakland um, of a woman who is 
an extremely divisive figure in this conversation. Um, you know, some people see her as a terrorist and other people see her as an activist. And that is a really complicated dialectic. Um, and, you know, obviously we got tons and tons of feedback from readers who were not happy with the inclusion. Um, you know, for me, uh, you know, I'll share something really personal, which is that um, I, one of those letters came from my cousin um, who didn't realize that I was on the other end of the email. And, uh, you know, this is a person I've, I've known for 35 years. Um, and it was really, really upsetting to, you know, see the sort of, you know, the, the dehumanizing, the, the flattening of, of the dialogue in this way. Um, this is something I, I haven't spoken publicly about at all. But, um, you know, I, I, I responded to him because I felt like it was clear to me that he didn't know that I was on the other end. He had, you know, sort of read about it, copied and pasted something and sent me this note. And I felt like, you know, man, there's so much in this right here. It's like an opportunity for me to reach out to my family and say, hey, you know me. You've known me for 35 years. You know that I'm not a monster. You know that I have a nuanced understanding of the world around me. You know that, you know, you've known me as a person who has, you know, dug my my heels in the sand for stories and for people that I believe in, that I believe are worth telling. So maybe, maybe there's more nuance to this than you are willing to look at when you copy and paste this, you know, this this letter to me, you know, admonishing, you know, this choice. And it was a super interesting dialogue. You know, you know, I'm sure you get a lot of, you know, stick to food. Food is not political. Well, you know, OK, like food is actually like the most political thing that you do every single day. And, um, you know, it was it was really interesting. And I think ultimately for me and I think for a lot of people that I respect, you know, having making space in our work for. Um, for marginalized voices um, is is like vitally it, it's vitally paramount. important. It's paramount what we do at Taste. I mean, it really is. It has, and you're. I mean, you're doing amazing work here Thank you. as well. And I love reading so many of your stories. I mean, they're so like rich and nuanced, and you know, I really respect what you're doing here. And and it is, um, it's not optional. It's not. Um, it's not a lark. It's not a moment. Um, it's paradigmatic and it is, it's the responsibility. And if you're not doing it, then you're not really doing the work. Yeah. It's like you're in the vapor trail of, of where this, this industry that we care so much about is heading. So let's talk about Detroit and oh, Fern, sure. Ferndale specifically. Yeah. Um, what excited you about Voyager? You know, um, Detroit and, you know, Detroit is one of the cities that I've really you know, fallen in love with in, in the last few years. And, you know, it's a complicated story, as I think, you know, we've, we've read a lot of stories about Detroit, you know, um, because the movement has largely been, you know, chefs and restaurateurs who are white. And uh, it is a really complicated thing to talk about. I think Ferndale, you know, it's not even, you know, it's not Metro Detroit. It's like outside of Detroit. Um, and there's so much happening in the city as well. Like, you know, Kate Williams was one of our best new chefs this year. And she's amazing. I mean, her stories, you know, when you talk to the people who are working on progress in a city like Detroit, you know, like Kate has generations of history there. She, you know, her parents met around the corner from her restaurant. Her grandfather lived in an apartment near like the Irish League or something like around the corner. And so, um, you know, she she's one of the city's own. And it's just really, it's just, as with uh, Voyager itself, you know, these are opportunities to see the city through the people who love it best and who are creating um services and amenities and things to be proud of within within this rapidly changing city. I feel similarly about St. Louis. I mean, St. Louis was, um, I, I feel like I've spoken till I'm blue in the face about yeah. that city. But, you know, my favorite thing is to go to a town where I actually don't know anyone. Mm -hmm. And in St. Louis, I literally did not know one single soul the first time I went there, like literally not one person. I called Danny Meyer and I was like, uh, hey, uh, 
do you want to come to St. Louis with me? Because I need to do some scouting and I don't know anyone there. And he was like, well, actually, like I have an empire to run. So uh, no, but let me introduce you to some people. Yeah. <laughs> so he introduced me to Mike Emerson um, of the, the Pappy's Legacy. And Mike picked me up in a pickup truck and he has like a ZZ Top beard. And I came around the corner wearing, you know, like my slash coat and like these giant sunglasses. And we you saw each crew. other. We saw each other for the first <laughs> time. And I was like, are you my daddy? And like, you know, and we just, you know, he took me around and and uh, I met a lot of people in that city and truly fell in love with it because it is, you know, it's a great American city. It's, you know, I, I you know, obviously wrote about Michael Galena at Vicia, which is a new restaurant there. But, you know, it's it's, um, you know, it's got like the biggest Bosnian community outside of the Balkan, you know. And so there's there's an amazing culture that's bubbling under the surface. And if I only went and only went to Visia, then I would have missed that. So, you know, it was a it was a it was a real pleasure to kind of fall in love with it through his eyes. And Give us another uh, city uh, with no spoilers that you're you're similarly enchanted with um, and you're just or interested in, I'll say. Ooh. Long pause. Yeah. Um, Without spoilers, I, mean, I know you're working on lots of stories. Yeah, this is really, it's, I'm challenged right now. I'm confronted right now because I, I, there are some cities that I am excited about, but I just, if I said them right now, then it would be incredibly obvious why I'm interested in them. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I need to keep that a little bit close to the vest. But, um, you know, generally, I mean, I'm going to say what like every food writer in America is saying right now, which is that like, L.A. is like where it's at. And well, I think it's a moving target in L.A. You know, we were talking about um, Congo's place, uh, Baru, like two years ago. Mm-hmm. That place kind of has come and gone. I'm not sure if he's even in the country. Now we're talking about other restaurants in L.A. I just think there's – it's always should be in the conversation. I agree. I roll my eyes when I hear about L.A. having written about the city for a decade and loving it and going there a lot. But man, like, let's talk about L.A. Like, yeah. what makes you excited about that city? Well, you know, it's so funny because, like, the the language for so long around L.A. was like, wow, L.A. is like a new, exciting food city. And it's like, Roll you know, eyes. Jesus. I mean, <laughs> it's all, it was like the only city to have, you know, a Pulitzer winning food writer in it for a very long time who, you know, wrote about all of the city's um, food in the most, you know, loving and beautiful and, you know, um, empathic way for for so long. And so it's just, there's an absurdity, you know, it's like when you open a food magazine and it's like, you know, white man goes to China, discovers noodles. Like, it's just like the, the sort of like auteur that we're like all sort of like, wow, Southern California has great food, you know, like this just in. It's just, a, you know, these things are cyclical, you know, they like run in, um, that you know, we just like we revisit things and we act like they're brand new, and that's just kind of the nature. It's gotta of be things. a push and pull for you. I'm just gonna say, like, you must be torn when your publication, just by the nature of it being a magazine and having to do packages and having to put bows on things and having 800 words, like, how do you deal with the packaging of restaurant culture? At food and wine, because you you do it, you have to. Yeah, I mean, you know, luckily, you know, the magazine is only one piece of of the food and wine picture. You know, we obviously, you know, we have an extremely robust, you know, digital identity. You know, we engage with our readers socially in you know in exciting ways. Uh, you know, and part of it is that you know you just have to think like, okay, like what goes in the magazine is you know, going to be this, you know, beautifully sort of polished, sanded version, and then you know. We're going to throw people online so that we can tell like the, you know, more fleshed out kind of multidisciplinary, you know, um, version of of what we found along the way. And, you know, of course, there's, you know, you kill a lot of darlings in the process there because you just want to tell so much. I mean, I literally just wrote this story um, that was I I went on a road trip through Appalachia with this chef and – I was supposed to file it at 600 words. I filed it at 1,300. You know, I had, you know, I shot it myself. I had so much to say and learned so much on that journey. I mean, it was like prime. 600 words for yeah. a road trip? Uh, yeah, I know. That's like, I mean, uh, it was so hard. And oh I was, I literally filed it and I was like, please, like, find a way, find that's a like way. That's like captions, <laughs> man. I, 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 hear, I feel for you because the magazines are what they are. They're, yeah. they're, there's finite word, word counts yeah. in them. One of the cool things, though, is that, you know, just talking about how things, 
you know, oh, we are, things are a pendulum and cyclical and come back. I mean, we just um, we just came out with our September issue, which is um, our 40th anniversary issue at Food and Wine. And for it, it's like this, you know, it's kind of a special edition issue. And, you know, uh, we went back and looked at um, 40 recipes, one per decade of the last 40 years of Food and Wine. I thought it would be really cool to do like a quiz so people could see, could guess if it was like a new recipe or an old one because, you know, we'd spent a ton of time in the archives just like flipping through a million years of history and it was like, oh yeah, like this, you know, ceviche bowl from like, (laughs) you know, 1985 would be just as relevant today. And, you know, our... Our minds can't contain it. We need to. We're like goldfish, you know. It's been so fun. We talk. We write uh, at Taste. Obviously, write about home cooking as you do, not just restaurants. I got to ask you about home cooking, specifically your home cooking, specifically your hashtag Baroque breakfast. Ah, I love it. It's so fun, (laughs) and I think you should run with it. Explain what that is and what you're what you're trying to do there, because I love it. You should look at it on our Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, um, hashtag broke breakfast. Um, so you know, it's the the truth about. So basically, what it is is that I make myself very elaborate breakfasts. Um, I and I make them very beautiful, and I just like make them for myself. And um, I try to do it. I don't do it every day, but I I try to. Um, you know what that really where that really started is like when you travel as much as I do. When I'm home and in my own kitchen, I need to do things that make me feel like I'm home and remind me that I'm home and kind of ground me. And so I always say like I don't. I I know that like you know I work at Food and Wine and and our recipes are king and our recipes are amazing and you should go to our website and check them out. I actually don't cook using recipes very often. Uh, I also wrote a cookbook here, <laughs> Clarkson and Potter. So, uh, you know, don't take my word for it. But when I cook for myself, I rarely do. And uh, what I do like to say and what I think about when I cook for myself and when I make my breakfasts is that I like to do things um, that when I am doing that task in the kitchen, nothing else can be happening because – it requires that level of focus. So one of my favorite things to make for breakfast, I call them slow scrambies. Um, and uh, shout out Justin Yu, who hates that, but whatever. Um, I literally will make them over the, like, you know, 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, just slow and slow and slow. And so what I like about that is that it requires so much attention and care that I can't do a million other things while I'm doing it. And you know what? Like my life, all of our lives are so fragmented. Like we're always just in a million places at once. And for me, just being in my kitchen, in my home, cooking for myself and making something that asks so much of me, but is also for me, is like an incredible meditation. It's so true. And it's not just what's on the plate. It's like the actual, the shopping, the planning, the cleaning up. It's just the whole process of cooking. It's why I identify with it so so much. It just is that separation from the crazy world when you have that in our tiny New York apartments exactly. or in our large apartments when we're cooking at friends' houses. It's it's just, uh, it's such a, a great thing to do. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it is, I hate this, but it's like, it's self-care. It I mean, really is. You know, no, and, and breakfast no is also, even when I'm in New York, you know, I'm frequently still out at restaurants at night. So breakfast is like one of the only times when I really have like a stretch in my home and it's quiet and it's just, it's just mine. And it's just become this thing that, you know, and the hashtag is really just kind of my way of keeping track of it. So I can go back and like look at the things that I've eaten and the ways that I've taken care of myself. And, um, you know, I, I I just really value it. I'm actually we're going to do a story about brec- about my breakfast um, and food and wine oh, in uh, the next few months. So look out for that. Uh, I and mean, the funny thing is that they, they wanted to run recipes with it. And I was like. There are no recipes. Like, <laughs> like I don't know how to it's make it. It's a hashtag. It's a vibe. <laughs> we asked all of our guests on the Taste Podcast. Um, I know this is special because you have written a cookbook, but give us your dream cookbook project that you would author. Oh, my God. Yes. Um, okay. So after I did Tacos with Alex Stupak, which continues to be like – basically the thing that I'm the most proud of in my whole career. I Not just the work itself, but also the relationship with Alex, who is an incredibly special person in my life. I respect him more than any other chef. He is a remarkable person. Um, and everything that I know about that culture and that cuisine is a gift from him. Um, I'm eternally grat- grateful. Um, but one of the things that I thought of when I was working on that book 
which was, you know, I just learned so much about Mexican ingredients in the Mexican pantry, was that was how similar the Mexican pantry felt to the Indian uh, pantry and how interesting it is that you – the thing that makes something taste Mexican versus even like Italian or certainly Indian is just like the sort of nuance of like how you handle the ingredient. Do you toast it? Do you roast it? Do you broil it? Do you, you know, do you blend it? Do you, you know, eat it whole? Like whatever it is, it's like those are the things that make something taste like itself. Uh, and I thought, oh, my God, you know, so many these rece- recipes could be Indian food. It's just like it would be handled slightly differently. So I would love to write – a cookbook about Indian food and really just learn it. Yeah. And, um, and I thought you, know, you were going to say the crossover of the two because there really be. is very little crossover. But yeah, write a book about Indian food. What, what would you focus on? What would be what would be the hook? What's the angle? Oh God, I I don't know what that. I mean, I would want to write it with someone. I yeah. you know I'd want to write it you know with a with a domain expert who um, you know it's not just me sort of you know deciding what it is. I I would want to write it with an Indian chef. Um, or, you know, it, uh, an Indian person who loves to cook. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a chef with a restaurant. But, um, you know, I I just – I'm into nuance, man. Like, you know, just like the Baroque breakfast where I spend 20 minutes cooking fucking eggs. Like, whoop, sorry. Um, I, I also, like, I want to know about, like, the toasting and grinding of spices. I want to know about the stew that spends, you know, 12 hours on the stove. I want – you know, uh, the focus is always just, like – how can I go like as granular as humanly possible and look at like the studs of a thing? And that is exciting to me always. Jordana Rothman, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs> the Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>